welcome indeed to our service on this crisp December morning, especially any, if we have any visitors, I'm not sure we have, but we trust you'll enjoy your time with us. There's a fellowship meeting this evening uh, as the second Sabbath in the month. Uh, that'll be at coming along at 7.30 to the minor hall. Uh, there'll be a cup of tea and so on available there, and we'll commence or worship or study at 8 p.m. So that's half seven for eight. Uh, all welcome to that. Then the uh, midweek is on Wednesday evening again at 8 p.m. in the minor hall. Um, now, a very special um, committee meeting this week. Um, can I emphasize that? On Thursday the 15th, at 8 p.m. in the minor hall. There are issues and so on there with uh, the, the refurbishment that need to be dealt with. The uh, next week, next Sabbath morning, we'll have the Reverend Malcolm Ball uh, as um, John will be taking the service in Derwick, is it? Or Ballylagan. Okay, Ballylagan. Okay. Uh, then, just a a reminder that the end of year reports are due in the new year and the various secretaries and office holders, well, we'd, we'd need to begin planning at least for that. The covenant or witness subscription is due and, and give your remittance to Jean Miller, please. Cost is £20 for the year. Then for the young people, there's Bally Clabber are hosting a party on Friday week, that's the 23rd of December, starting at 8 p.m., uh, 16 plus, and that's in their church hall. So with that, I'll hand over to John for today's service. morning. Our call to worship this morning comes from Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 11, where the prophet says of the Lord, I, I am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. And we think of how those words speak of our, our Savior, Christ Jesus. And we can go forward to the New Testament and to Acts where these words are fulfilled, when Peter and John stand before the Jewish courts and they say, there is salvation found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And of course, they are referring to Jesus Christ. And so it's through Jesus that we approach God this morning to worship. It's because he has died and saved us from our sins And so we come and we worship our God today. We sing praise from Psalm 19. We're singing from Psalm 19a. Psalm 19a, and we're singing stanzas 5 to 9, and we're singing it to tune to 120 or 222. Psalm 19a, we're singing stanzas 5 through to 9. Here we see God's law being mentioned here. And each of our psalms today are going to be bringing us back to the word of God. And that's what we're going to see in our service of how during the reign of Josiah, there was the discovery of God's word once again. And it was after years of declension. And here uh, the psalmist speaks of God's word and look at the, uh, how he describes it in stanza five. The Lord's most perfect law restores the, lo- the soul that dies. God's word brings life. And we could think of Christ Jesus when he came uh, uh, in, uh, as that uh, man in, in the New Testament 
and how he was the word that became flesh, and how he said that receiving his word would bring life. And it's not what we've known in our own hearts. By the work of the Holy Spirit in us, we have known God's word, God's law, bring life in us. And so we, we are commanded to walk in it, to adhere to it, to be close uh, always uh, towards it. And so we sing stanzas uh, five through to nine. Let's stand and sing praise to God. Let's pray. Lord God, we do praise you this morning for your life-giving word. Lord, we praise you that you have given it to man. Lord, we praise you that you have revealed it to man and that we have been able to receive it. Lord, we praise you that we've been able to receive it because your Holy Spirit has worked in our hearts and has planted that word in our lives that it's grown forth. Lord, we praise you that it is that which restores our dead souls and makes them living. We praise you, Lord, that it is that which makes us wise. Lord, we praise you that it is that which guides us in our lives. And we praise you, Lord, for also Christ Jesus, the one Lord who has defeated sin, that, Lord, they may no longer reign over us, 
that we, Lord, would be removed of the sins uh, that we are, uh, that cling to us, the stains of sin and the impurity. And Lord, we thank you that because of Christ, we, Lord, can win your approval, that we can stand before you and you, Lord, call us your beloved children. Lord God, we pray that you would forgive us each today for our sins. Lord, forgive us for where we've had pride in our hearts. Lord, forgive us where we've had deafness to your word. Uh, forgive us, Lord, where we have openly rebelled against you. Lord, forgive us for where we haven't counted your word as precious. Lord, forgive us for where we have uh, stooped to the innovations of our own hearts, Lord, instead of doing as you command. Lord, forgive us for each of our thoughts and our words and our deeds which have not uh, pleased you and have actually, Lord, displeased you. Lord, cleanse us afresh in the name, that worthy name of Christ our Saviour, we ask. Amen. We're going to read from Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. <clears throat> I'm going to read from verse 18 through to the end of the chapter. At this stage in, God's, uh, in John's uh, letter, Revelation, um, he has been writing to seven different churches. Begins in chapter 2, you can see that he writes to Ephesus and Pergamon and Thyatira. Then it continues in chapter 3 as he writes to Sardis, uh, uh, Philadelphia, uh, Laodicea. And as he writes to each of these churches, um, sorry, I missed Smyrna there in chapter 2 as well. As he writes to each of these churches, he brings words of encouragement to them, but he also brings words of rebuke because they're churches that have deviated from what God has asked of them in their word. And so he brings a word of warning to them that unless they cut off the uh, imaginations and the innovations of man, they will, the lampstand will be removed from them. The lampstand referring to Christ's presence in the church. And so we read uh, from the church uh, or the, what John says to the church in Thyatira. Reading from verse 18 of chapter 2. To the angel of the church in Thyatira, write, These are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and your perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate this, that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess. By her teachings, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on her bed of suffering and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely until they repent of her, of her ways. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds. And I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you. Only hold to what you have until I come. To him, to him who overcomes and does my will to the end, I will give authority over nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter, and will dash them into pieces like pottery. Just as, I have received, just as I have received authority from my father, I will also give him the morning star. He who has an ear, 
Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. We then want to turn back into the Old Testament to 2 Kings, please. 2 Kings. We're going to read from chapter 23. Judah is about to go into exile here. The nation of uh, the kingdom of Judah, remember the kingdom of Israel has been divided in two. Judah in the south, Israel in the north. And Israel has already went into captivity. She's been taken off by Assyria. And now Judah is close to captivity also because of her rebellion against God. Over the years, the kings have led Israel or Judah away from God, away from what God requires in his word, the way that God asks his people to worship him. And they've brought their own inventions uh, to worship. And so they've mingled uh, pure worship with the worship of the pagans. And so uh, Josiah is raised up by God as the next king in chapter 22. And as they're doing building work in the temple, they find the scroll of the law. They find the Old Testament, the first five books at least of of our Old Testament. And Josiah reads them. And Josiah sees the desperate state of the church, of how far it's wandered from God. And so what we're going to read in chapter 23 is the reforms Josiah brings to the church or he works in tandem with the religious leaders in the church to bring these reforms. And much of it is getting out and getting rid of what man has brought in. And so we read from chapter 23. Then the king called together all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem He went up to the temple of the Lord with the people of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests and the prophets, all the people from at least uh, from the least to the greatest. He read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant, which had been found in the temple of the Lord. The king stood by the pillar and renewed the covenant in the presence of the uh, of the Lord to follow the Lord and to keep his commands, statutes and decrees with all his heart and with all his soul, thus confirming the words of the covenant written in this book. Then all the people pledged themselves to the covenant. The king ordered Hilkiah, the high priest, and the priests next in rank of the doorkeepers to remove from the temple of the Lord all the articles made for Baal, and Asherah, and all the starry hosts. He burned them outside Jerusalem in the fields of the Kidron Valley and took the ashes to Bethel. He did away with the idolatrous priests appointed by the kings of Judah to burn incense on the high places of the towns of Judah and to those around the Jerusalem. Those who burned incense to Baal, to the sun and to the moon, to the constellation and to all the starry hosts. He took the Asherah pole from the temple of the Lord to the Kidron Valley outside Jerusalem and burned it there. He ground it into powder and scattered it, scattered the dust over the graves of the common people. He also tore down the quarters uh, of the male shrine prostitutes that were in the temple of the Lord. And the quarters were the women that did the weaving for the Asherah. Josiah brought all the priests from the towns of Judah and desecrated the high places from Geba to Beersheba, where the priests had burned incense. He broke down the gateway at the entrance of the gate of Joshua and the city governor, which was on the left of the city gate. Although the priests of the high places did not serve at the altar of the Lord in Jerusalem, they ate unleavened bread with their fellow priests. He desecrated Topheath, uh, which was in the valley of Ben-Himon, so no one could use it to sacrifice their son or daughter on the fire to Molech. He removed from the entrance of, to the temple of the Lord the horses that the kings of Judah had dedicated to the sun. There they were in the court near the room of the official named Nathan Melech. 
Josiah then burned the chariots dedicated to the sun. He pulled down the altars to the kings of Judah, or the, of the kings of Judah had erected on the roof near the upper room of Ahaz. And the altars Manasseh had built in the two courts of the temple of the Lord. He removed them from there, smashed them into pieces, and threw the rubble into the Kidron Valley. The kings also uh, desecrated the high places. Or sorry, the king also desecrated the high places that were east of Jerusalem, on the south of the hill of corruption, the ones Sodom, king of Israel, had built for Asheroth and the vile goddess of the Sidonians, for Chemosh, the vile god of Moab, and for Molech, the detestable god of the people of Ammon. Josiah smashed the sacred stones and cut down the Asheroth poles and covered the sites with human bones. Even the altars of Bethel, the high place made by Jeroboam, son of Nebat, who had caused Israel to sin, even that altar, the high place he demolished. He burned the high place and ground it into powder and burned the Asherah pole also. Then Josiah looked around, and when he saw the tombs that were there on the hillside, he had the bones removed from them and burned on the altar to defile it in accordance with the word of the Lord that, 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 with the word of the Lord proclaimed by the man of God who foretold these things. The king asked, What is that tombstone I see? The people of the city said, It marks the tomb of the man of God who came from Judah and pronounced against the altar of Bethel the very things that you have done to it. Leave alone, he said. Do not let anyone disturb his bones. So they spared his bones and those of the prophet who had come from Samaria. Just as he had done at Bethel, Josiah removed all the shrines at the high places that the kings of Israel had built in the towns of Samaria that, he arri- that had aroused the Lord's anger. Josiah slaughtered all the priests of those high places on the altars and burned human bones on them. He went back to Jerusalem. The king gave this order to all the people. Celebrate the Passover to the Lord your God as it is written in this book of the covenant. Neither in the days of the judges who led Israel nor in the days of the kings of Israel and the days of the kings of Judah had such a Passover been observed. But in the 18th year of King Josiah, this Passover was celebrated to the Lord in Jerusalem. Furthermore, Josiah got rid of the mediums and the spiritists, the household gods, the idols, and all the other detestable things seen in Judah and Jerusalem. He did this to fulfill uh, the requirements of the law written in the book that Hilkiah, the priest, had discovered in the temple of the Lord. Neither before nor after Josiah was there a king like him who turned to the Lord as he did with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his strength in accordance with all the law of Moses. Amen. Boys and girls, do you want to come to the front? Well, boys and girls, I have a picture here to show you this morning, a picture of a man who lived some time ago. It's not a proper picture. It's a, um, a painting as such of him because there were no cameras in that day. Okay. There you go, Grace and Hannah. Right. This is a man called John Calvin. And he was a man who lived a very long time ago, and he actually lived all over Europe. He lived in Paris. He lived in Switzerland. He even lived in Germany at a time as well. He lived so long ago, it's about 500 years, more, just over 500 years since he uh, lived here. And he was a believer. 
He loved God and he loved God's word. And we're going to be thinking a little bit, there'll be reference made to John uh, Calvin during our sermon today. And I thought it'd be good for you to understand just a little bit about what he did. In John's day, the church was in a really terrible state, boys and girls. The gospel wasn't preached that the forgiveness of sins was through Jesus Christ. There were all these images round the church buildings. There were prayers offered, but the prayers weren't offered to God. They were instead offered to other men and women who were now dead. And so, uh, boys and girls, there was lots of other things that had been added into the church. And so the church was really very different to the way that Jesus had set it up in the New Testament. But Calvin, Calvin is raised up by God and he begins reading God's word. And as he reads God's word, he's one of the men God uses to lead the church back to worship as God had commanded, to live as God had commanded. And his principle that he argued throughout the Reformation was that what God hasn't commanded, we're not to do. So he was saying, if God hasn't told us to do this, then we can't do it. So if God hasn't told us to live in this way, then we can't do that. If God hasn't told us to worship in that way, we can't uh, do that either. And that's just what we've been reading about in the man Josiah that we read of in 2 Kings. He was a king in Judah and he did the same thing. They found God's word buried in the temple. And as they pulled it out and they began to read it, they realized that they weren't living and worshiping as God had commanded And so there was what we would call reform. There was the return to what God had prescribed people to live and how to worship him. And boys and girls, that's the same way that we should live our lives. As those of us, as we love Jesus, as we love God, we are to worship. We are to live for God only in the ways he has commanded us. Well, you've got your sheet today. You've got a picture of Josiah on the back as he reads God's word, as we read in 2 Kings 23. And there's some places for you to fill in on the front. All right. You up. James. There you go, Grace. Do you want one for Naomi as well? Good job. All right, Anna. Let's worship God as we give to him our tithe. We're going to sing again. We're going to sing this time from Psalm 119. Psalm 119, and we're singing part 1A. We're singing it to tune um, 270. And here it is another psalm, the Psalm 119 is really the psalm which, is, uh, which speaks uh, in a very focused way about God's word, God's law, God's law, God's word, um, could be interchangeable words here, and how he loves God's word. Psalms of one, how blessed are those whose way is pure, for in the Lord's law they do walk. Blessed who is, who his testimonies keep, and who with their whole heart him seek. <clears throat> 
And once again, when we sing words like this, uh, we are challenged about how uh, we struggle to uh, seek God with our whole hearts, of how our lives and our walk with him is not blameless. But don't we give thanks for our Savior, Christ Jesus, because he's the one who could sing these words and say, I've done that. That's me. And Jesus has done it because he knows that we can't. And so as we stand in him, as we depend upon him in faith, uh, these words will be said of us and we'll be able to sing ourselves one day in heaven because we will be perfect individuals too. So let's stand and sing the whole of this psalm together. Let's praise God. Let's pray. Lord God, we do thank you that your way is true. And Lord, we thank you that you've given us your word, that we would know, Lord, who you are, what we are without you, the way, Lord, to you, and the way to live for you. And Father, we thank you, Lord, for Christ Jesus, who has accomplished our salvation, that he, Lord, is the one who has wholeheartedly sought you, that he is the one, Lord, who does not need to be shamed when ashamed when he stands, Lord, in the presence of you and your law. For, Lord, he has kept it all. Lord God, we thank you that it is by his help, by the enablement of the Holy Spirit, that we are able to strive in greater and greater obedience to you. And so, Lord, help each one of us in this walk and in this pursuit, Lord, as we seek to do this each day. Lord, we have been reminded, Lord, uh, this past week of our dependence upon you for safety in our travels, particularly, Lord, in the icy road conditions and the coldness of the days outside. And we thank you, Lord, for how you brought us here safely today. We thank you, Lord, for how you've given us safety as we've been out on the roads this past week. We thank you, Lord, for how you've watched over our loved ones as they've been out too on the roads and how you've brought them back safely. Lord God, we want to also uh, give you uh, thanks, Lord, for the uh, work in our uh, brother congregation in uh, Ballyclare. And we give you thanks, Lord, for the new elders and the two new deacons that are there. Lord, we thank you for your provisions for that church. We thank you, Lord, for your answering of prayers. We thank you for how you have raised up godly men to serve in these offices. And Lord, we pray that you would greatly bless them and that you would greatly use these men for the honour and for the glory of your name. Lord, we pray that as we now come to turn our attention to the, your word, we pray that, Lord, you would grant us the understanding by the Holy Spirit. We pray that you would help us, Lord, to be like those of the Bereans, Lord, who searched your word for the truth and then received it with faith 
and obedience. When we saw that when they saw it was true. Lord, we pray this same thing for us. In Christ's name. Amen. Last week we began a short topical series called Revisiting Christmas. We began by exploring, hopefully you remember, about what the scriptures say about the incarnation. Now remember, the incarnation refers to the act of God becoming man. Most specifically, Jesus Christ taking man's nature and being born of the woman. And so last week we surveyed what the uh, the what one noted what the Old Testament said about this. We noted the verbal and the visible prophecies uh, of Christ coming uh, to earth. And then we observed in our final point of the fulfillment of these prophecies through Christ's earthly life as the Son of God who was born of the woman taking man's nature. At the end of our study, we concluded that the incarnation was essential for salvation. It was crucial. But we admitted that the act of Jesus becoming man didn't save us from our sins. Salvation was accomplished when Christ went to the cross. And he died there in our place, taking upon himself our sins, burying God's wrath and judgment for our guilt and then going to the grave and being raised on the third day. That's when salvation was accomplished. But without Christ becoming man, none of that would have taken place. And so we saw how Christ's incarnation is not the pinnacle of uh, the the mountain range. Rather, it's a, a low ridge, we could say. And that it's Jesus' death and resurrection which are the summit of the mountain. They are the apex of salvation. Our study today builds on what we looked at last week. And so today we want to look at the incarnation in the church. The incarnation in the church. We want to begin by observing what unfolds in the rest of the New Testament. Before we look at the historical practice of the church since the New Testament, and we want to evaluate that in the light of the Scriptures. We're going to look at three periods, we could say. We're going to look at what I've called the apostolic church. That's the time when the apostles were alive, when they were living and serving. Those years that we read about in the New Testament, when men like Peter and John and James and Paul were all alive, and it's ends with the Apostle John at his death around the uh, turn of the the first century. We're going to then look at what I've called the post-apostolic church, and that the, uh, the, the clue is in its name. It's after the apostles. And so we're going to look at what happened in that period after the apostles for about a thousand years, well, over a thousand years. And then we're going to look at the Reformed church, Speaking to the boys and girls about John Calvin, that's when he emerges and he appears in the scene. Don't worry, today is not going to be a lecture. It's not going to be a history class. You haven't fallen back into fifth form and you're there with that terrifying history teacher. I can promise you that. It's not that. Rather, I want us to note some significant events that happened in that period and evaluate them in the light of what we saw taught in Scripture and what we'll see further taught in Scripture today. And so let's begin with the incarnation in the apostolic church. That's when the apostles were ministering, when they were serving after Christ had ascended uh, into heaven. We get to summarize these years as years of transition. Years of transition. Cast your mind back to the Old Testament 
Remember there, God had commanded his people to celebrate various feasts and festivals. There was the Passover, and it was celebrated by Israel, marking their exodus out of Egypt. There was the Feast of Weeks, which marked the first fruits of the wheat harvest. There was the Feast of Tabernacles. Remember where they went out and they built little tents, and it memorialized that time when God had delivered protected, provided, and been that faithful God to them as Israel had wandered through the wilderness. Then we could think too of Rosh Hashanah, a word that we're familiar with perhaps with the Jewish New Year. And then there's the Day of Atonement when the nation came together in Jerusalem and they confessed their sins and sought pardon through those typical sacrifices. And so God had commanded the Old Testament church to mark each of these occasions. We could have looked at the Bible texts which um, command those in Exodus and Leviticus and Deuteronomy. And as we know, each of these festivals had the shadowy rituals of what was to come. Each of these pointed to the Messiah each of, the, each of the Israelites were looking forward to the Christ who would come and be that unblemished lamb. The one who would come and give them final forgiveness and atonement for their sins. The one who would die in the place of man. Man becoming and standing in the place of man. They were looking forward to Jesus becoming man. They were expecting the incarnation in each of these festivals. And so when we come into the New Testament, the Jewish church is still present. And the apostles then are having to minister during years of transition. They're wanting to leave behind those shadowy feasts and festivals of the Old Testament and embrace what Paul calls the substance in Christ. Christ being the fulfillment of them. And so for a time Within the church, Jewish Christians participated in some of the traditions of Judaism. We could think of Paul. Remember, he's on his third, second missionary journey, I think it is. And he's, he meets Timothy. And he goes and he gets Timothy circumcised. Technically, he didn't need to get Timothy circumcised anymore because Christ had come. He had fulfilled that Old Testament sign of the cutting away of the flesh, the shedding of blood, because Christ's blood had been shed. But Paul gets Timothy circumcised for the sake of the church that he would be working in. We could think of Paul. Remember when he comes to Jerusalem in Acts 20, 21, I think it is, and he's there and he takes that oath in Jerusalem and he goes and he fulfills the oath with those other Jewish men and then it leads finally to him getting in prison because the Jews stir up trouble for him. And so there was a time when the old things of the Old Testament were still practiced in the New Testament church. But as time progressed, these Jewish festivals became less prominent in Christianity and they passed away. During the transition, the apostles wouldn't impose the Jewish religious calendar on the Gentile Christians. Remember, we see the church defending the Gentiles' liberty at the Jerusalem Council, where they say, no, the Gentile Christians don't have to be circumcised. We could think also of Paul, who writes in their defense also, in Colossians 2.15. And he describes the Old Testament Jewish feasts and festivals as a shadow of the things to come. And it's not what we've used before. We Remember we saw in Joseph that he was a, a foreshadow, that he was a shadow of the light that would come in Christ. And so those Old Testament rituals were a shadow of the fulfillment that would come in Christ. Jesus Christ is the substance, he reminds them. He is the fulfillment. Jesus is far superior to the Old Testament feasts and festivals. And so Paul says it's time to let go of those and to embrace Christ. And that's the very reason why the book of Hebrews was written. 
Remember, the book of Hebrews is all about saying Jesus is better. He's better than the high priests of the Old Testament. He's better than the sacrifices of the Old Testament. He's better than Moses. Jesus has come and he is the fulfillment. And so the writer was wanting to teach the Jewish believers that Jesus had fulfilled the Old Testament, that the new was greater, that the old needs of the religious calendar had passed away. And so the apostles themselves no longer practiced the two bloody sacraments of the Old Testament. Remember, the sacraments of the Old Testament were circumcision and the Passover. And instead, the apostles observed the two bloodless sacraments commanded by Christ, the ones that we practice here today. Remember, it was Christ who instituted the Lord's Supper. Do this in remembrance of me. And then Christian baptism. He's there on the mountain. He's about to ascend into heaven. He has the, his, the 11 apostles around him, and he says, go therefore into the nations, baptizing And so he instituted and commanded baptism there at the end of Matthew's gospel in chapter 28. The only other thing Jesus changed was the day of the week that they were to gather for worship. It was no longer to be the last day of the week. It was now the first day of the week, which is now the day that we worship on. These were years of transition. In recent years, there's been the withdrawal of notes and coins in our currency. Those old paper notes are gone, aren't they? And we have these lovely plastic notes that are now in our wallets. The old round pound coin has been replaced by the dodecagon uh, pound coin. And for each, there was a period where those paper notes, those ripped and dog-eared paper notes were coming alongside those plastic ones. And the old round point coins with those new point coins. And didn't you know it when you went to the supermarket and all you had was the new point coins and you couldn't put it in your trolley to get it working. And so there was a time when both these were put together, where both were found during this period of transition. Despite the new notes and the new pound coin being superior to the old, it was used in tandem as the old was slowly phased out of circulation. The apostles ministered. The apostolic church was a period of transition. When the old things of the Old Testament were still there, but they were being slowly phased out as the new came in and the people understood the greatness of the new. And so throughout the New Testament, we see the apostles observing and commanding the church to observe what Christ had commanded. They were to keep the Lord's day, marking Christ's resurrection. And they were to observe the Lord's Supper to remember his death. The apostles created no Christian calendar. They added no other holy days. They omitted no command of Christ, nor did they add to the commands of Christ. In the New Testament, we find no celebration of Christ's birth. It was neither ordained or commanded by Christ, nor was it promoted or practiced by the apostles. The incarnation in the apostolic church Let's think now of the incarnation in the post-apostolic church. That period of time after John, the last apostle, had died, the whole way through really into the Reformation in the 1500s. Probably the question that is in all of our minds now is, what is the origins of Christmas? When did it enter the church How did it begin to be celebrated if it wasn't there in the apostolic church? Well, by the third century, 
several fasts were being observed by the church. Days where they marked as preparation for um, other days. So, for example, before Palm Sunday, as it's now been called, there was a fast in preparation for the particular marking of Christ's resurrection from the dead. But these have been added by men within the church. A man, a theologian called Origen, he was a bit of a historian as well. He's a bit of a buff in history. Um, And he records for us a list of all those different fasts that were observed in the church and all the different festivals. And there's no mention of Christmas nor any form of celebration of Christ's birth or celebration of Christ's birth by the church by the middle of the uh, third century. And so we see for 200 years after the apostles' death, there was no celebration in December. However, there were numerous pagan celebrations held at the end of the year. And these, conju- uh, these were held in conjunction with the winter solstice. These were ceremonies that celebrated the birth of different pagan gods in around the 25th of December. During these centuries, the church found herself surrounded by paganism, and she felt the pressure of it around her. And the church in Rome rightly desired to reach out to the lost, wanted to bring the good news to them. However, their missional response to paganism was not biblical distinction. Instead, they promoted syncretism, And syncretism is where you combine two radically different ideas and you blend them together. It's a bit like when you get out your smoothie maker, maybe if you enjoy smoothies, and you you chop up all the different types of fruit, you pour in your your fruit juice of choice, and you, you blitz it, and it blends it all together. There was all these individual fruits beforehand, but it's blended together to be one smoothie drink of, uh, I don't know, forest fruits or, or whatever that you enjoy. And so the church in Rome, it took the pagan practices and it blended it with Christian ideas. Basically, they Christianized a pagan festival. And so the celebrations centered around the 25th of December. And Rome instituted a special mass to mark the occasion. They called it the Mass of Christ, which was later shortened to Christ Mass now known as Christmas. And so the the church blending of paganism with religion is not a new thing. We read of it, didn't we, in, in our Bibles there. And we could cite many different examples in Scripture to illustrate this fact. During the era of the judges, Israel was doing evil, what was evil in the sight of the Lord. They had amalgamated with the Philistines. They were actually living with the Philistines, worshipping like the Philistines. They had taken some of the ideas of uh, the nations around them, and they thought that would be good for us to add uh, as well as we uh, worship our gods. And so then God sends him Samson, and he was to be an agitator. Doesn't Samson wreak havoc throughout his whole life and he gets the Philistines' backs up the wrong way as he t- uh, ties together fox tails and lets it run through barley fields and he takes off gates of the city and he strips men naked. He was an agitator and he was beginning to break up that relationship, upset the relationship between Israel and Philistia, which would finally lead to their divorce or separation, we could say. And so then, the years after that, through Samuel and King David, there was um, a reform that came there. The Apostle John warns the church in Thyatira against her syncretistic tendencies. We read of it in Revelation 2. But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed by idols. Members in the church of Thyatira were incorporating worldly activities, worldly ideas with church, with Christian living. 
We know what it's like when we get that new smartphone. Nothing is on it. No contacts, none of those lovely photos, none of that, those apps that we, we use regularly. And so we peel off the plastic after we unbox it. We turn it on and it asks us for our email address. And so we uh, tap it in. And after you signed in, immediately the phone begins to sink. Before you know it, it's just like the old one. You have all those contacts. You have all those photos that you've taken. All those apps that were on the old, old phone are now on the new The old phone has synced with the new phone. Parts of our church today practice syncretism. She does so as she endorses cohabitation, permits no-fault divorce, and recognizes homosexuality. To be popular with the world, the church says you no longer need to keep the Lord's Day. You just have to give one hour out of the day and the rest of the day is yours. To attract the world, the church is disposed of biblical worship and instead her practices are not too dissimilar to secular concerts held on other nights of the week. To keep the world listening, the church has diluted the word of God to have no substance, never condemning always commanding, making people feel warm and fuzzy-hearted. Churches across our nation have married themselves to the world. Parts of the church have sacrificed the Bible on the altar of popularity. Her practice stands in stark contrast to the call of Christ, who said, you are to be a light, the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. And I knew that all so, oh so well the other night when I went to Rather Island. Rather Island is built on the rock. And it's this big, it's this small town set on this huge hill. And as I came down these icy roads, which I'll tell you a bit more about in a moment, uh, uh, you could see the lights of the town, and I, I knew exactly where I was supposed to go to. It stood out for miles, Rath Island, as it stood there on that hill, surrounded by those little smaller hills around it. That's what Christ calls us to be. We're to stand out from the world, not to be conformed, as Paul tells us later, to the world. We're to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. In what ways are we accommodating the world? Which ways are you or am I being conformed to the world? Which ways are we hiding our light under the basket, as Christ goes on to say in Matthew 5? The incarnation in the post-apostolic church. Let's think now of the incarnation in the Reformed Church. So I was on these country roads outside Rathr Island, and on Friday night, I got my experience of really icy weather. Being a townie, I hadn't really experienced this before. And so as I left the A1, a lovely salted road, I was relying on Google Maps to get me to Rathr Island. And you guessed it. Google Maps brought me the worst way possible. As I crossed these roads, these, uh, these were hilly roads and they were white and black with, this, uh, with ice. And at times the wheels spun as I went up hills before I glided down the far side. And just like my sliding down the hill, the decline in the Western church was steady for about 1,100 years. That's that time between the end of the apostolic church to the Reformation that we're thinking of now, to the point where it was unrecognizable when you compared it to what the apostles had left behind. Various scandals marred the popes. Church positions were sold to the highest bidder, and there was widespread greed among the clergymen. Man's word was superior to God's word. 
indulgences were the means of salvation. The communion table had become an altar. The church was in a terrible state. The church was ripe for reform. And the Reformation was led by a man like Luther. After Luther's conversion, he read the scriptures with new spirit-filled eyes, we could say. And he opposed the errors of the Roman Catholic Church through rigorous debate and writing of tracts. Luther couldn't be silenced and couldn't be rebuttaled because his criticisms and his arguments were grounded in Scripture. And he built his arguments upon Scripture. And so he brought Scripture reference after Scripture reference to prove why there was these errors within the church and why the church needed to reform. Luther had returned to the Word of God and used it for his defense. Calvin, he comes after him. And he continued to reform the church. Calvin also returned uh, to scripture principles. He maintained that the church should be directed by the word of God. He asserted that what Christ did not command or was not permitted. And he also uh, maintained that what the apostles had not commanded, those who were in authority after Christ, what they did not command or practice was also not permitted. In Scotland, our forefathers in the faith, men such as John Knox, were also reforming the Church of Scotland, reforming its theology and its practice according to the same principles that Luther and Calvin had set out. <laughs> Knox returned to the teaching of Scripture. He believed what Scripture did not command was forbidden. And so these men offloaded much of that what which the church had added over the centuries. And these included the feasts and fasts and festivals that man had invented. It was a return to the word instructed theology and practice. God's word became the basis for everything that they did. And what these men did was nothing new. We read of it earlier, didn't we, in 2 Kings 23. Josiah, as he reigned, the church was in a terrible state. And profound change took place at the discovery of the word of God. They began to read it and they realized what they were supposed, uh, what the errors that they had done and how they had deviated from God's word and what he had commanded. And so Israel's reforms always ended up in her returning to worshipping and living as God had commanded. The church today is ripe again for reform. We observed in our second point the syncretistic practices and even in our own hearts how we gravitate towards being like the world, of how we so easily become conformed rather than being transformed and renewed in our minds. Parts of the church are steeped in man's innovations. Others need reform in more subtle ways. Even our own denomination needs to reform. Even our own hearts need reformed. It's not because of traditionalism that we don't mark Christmas in the church. It's because we do not see any command for it in Scripture. It's not because we're traditionalists here within the Reformed Presbyterian Church that we don't see Christmas as a religious holiday. It's because we see Scripture doesn't make it one. Just because it's not a religious holiday and it's not to be marked by the church doesn't mean that we should ignore it as Christians or that we should refuse to be involved in some of the activities of it individually. Christmas is a reality in our society. It is a civil holiday. And so I'm not here next week, but in two weeks' time, we'll trace out some of the principles which enable us as Christians to 
to approach Christmas in society without letting it encroach on the church. Amen. Let's sing from Psalm 119, part 5a. We're singing it to tune uh, 14. And we're singing the whole of this uh, fifth part of Psalm 119. Psalm 119 is a really long psalm, and so we, we've, we've, we, split, we split it up to help us be able to navigate it. And so we're singing the, the fifth part of it um, together. And here it says, Teach me, O Lord, your statutes way, and I will keep it to the end. Give insight, and I'll keep your law to do it with my, all my heart attend. We need God to teach us if we are going to reform our hearts. We need God to teach us if the church is going to be reformed. We need God to teach us if our society is going to be reformed and brought back to him. And part of that reform is us turning our eyes from worthless things as we see in stanza three and looking to God and longing to live for him as we see in stanza four. Let's sing Psalm 119a, uh, singing part five. Let's praise God. Let's pray. Lord God, we do thank you once again for that life-giving word. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us the teacher, the leader, the guider, and the Holy Spirit, the one whom Christ promised to the disciples, the one who came at fullness in Pentecost, the one who dwells in our hearts in fullness now as we have faith in Christ Jesus. Lord God, we pray that you would help us to search our hearts and to know, Lord, the ways where we are strained from you. Lord, forgive us for where we have been conformed to the world. Forgive us, Lord, for we, where we have hidden our lights and our lamps under the basket. Forgive us, Lord, where we have shied away from being that city on the hill.
Lord God, please help us by the Holy Spirit to know, uh, Lord, where it is in our life that we need to confess sin and to turn from it. Lord, please give us the strength, the boldness, and the courage to stand and to walk according to your word. Lord, we thank you for how you've raised up those in the past to lead reform. And Lord, we pray that you would continue to bless the work that they have done. We pray these things in Christ's name we ask. My people of God, lift up your heads and receive his blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious.